and welcome to the fourth and final episode of this interview series, Cat to Vet Tales, uh, where I've been chatting with feline experts all about how we can keep our cats happy and healthy. I hope you've been enjoying this as much as I have. We've had some pretty, pretty incredible conversations. If you've missed any, please check out kittenlady.org slash catology so you can catch up on all of them. Um, Thank you again to Royal Canaan for partnering with me on this series and on the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign. I feel really inspired. I hope everybody is feeling inspired to stay curious about their cat's health. And um, I have a really exciting guest this week. We're going to be talking about the health of newly adopted kittens. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Ron Camerata on the the show today. Uh, He's an incredible veterinarian. He practices here in San. San Diego at Cabrillo Pet Hospital. And he is actually the veterinarian who treats my personal cats, as well as uh, the kittens from my nonprofit, Orphan Kitten Club. Dr. Camerata not only works at Cabrillo Pet Hospital, but he has also been working with the San Diego Humane Society for over 10 years. So he has an incredible wealth of knowledge about kitten health, and I'm so excited to have him here today to talk about that. So thank you so much, Dr. Camerata, for being here with me. And thank you, Hannah, for having me, and hope I can provide some good advice for all your kitten followers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's great to have you because you know you are uh, an amazing resource locally for us. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, you know, obviously the kittens that we're adopting out, we're adopting them out with as much veterinary care as they can have at that age. Um, And, you know, when people adopt a new kitten, they might be under the impression, you know, well, the, the organization said this is a fully vetted kitten, so I probably don't need to take them to the vet, right? Um, Can you talk about why, even when you adopt a kitten who came from an organization and has has seen a vet and seems healthy, why should people still consider taking them in for a first kitten checkup at a vet? Well, one of the most important things is vaccines. Um, They have to go through a series of vaccines. And the reason being, people may have a little understanding of vaccines now with COVID and, and their own vaccines. And we and animals, we make antibodies to help protect ourselves. And babies, human babies, all animal babies, they get an initial antibodies from the mother through their milk. And those antibodies protect the babies, you know, kittens specifically, somewhere up to eight weeks, even up to 16 weeks. And while those antibodies are protecting the babies, uh, they cannot produce their own antibodies to protect themselves. And so we repeatedly vaccinate them until at some point those antibodies run out and the baby kitten can reproduce their own antibodies and make their own immune response. Unfortunately, it's different from each kitten. So that's why we have to vaccinate them repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Another good one. Yeah, go ahead. I, I I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize because, you know, in the case of say adopting like an eight or nine week old kitten, you might be adopting a kitten who has had you know, one or two vaccines, um, but people are surprised when you tell them, yes, you're adopting a healthy and vaccinated kitten, but there's still an expectation that you need to bring them in for further vaccination. Yeah. And it's not the number of vaccines they receive. It's the age where they receive the last vaccine. Mm -hmm. So if a kitten had even three vaccines, you know, by 10 or 12 weeks old, they still need one more, you know, all the way through 16 weeks old. Um, If they get started later, okay, then they might only need a set of two or so, but all the way through 16 weeks old. Hmm. Yeah. And I I know that vaccination recommendations for kittens can, can be different depending on whether it's like a, a personal pet who's not exposed to other animals or if it's in a rescue setting, what are your recommendations for um, people who have newly adopted a kitten? You know, what age do you start and, um, we'll start them as early as six weeks, but most of the time we're starting them at eight weeks because getting a, you know, a, a sick, taking a kitten away from its mother at six weeks is a little too early. They actually learn a lot of good behaviors from the mother and the other kittens in the litter. Um, so normally we're starting them around eight weeks old and then we'll see them 
every three weeks until 16 weeks old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And each time they'll get a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Right. But might be different if it's like a, a foster or um, shelter setting. Yeah, in a shelter setting and foster settings, a lot of them will vaccinate almost every two weeks um, to make sure we don't miss that window of protection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we have higher higher exposure rates to some of those uh, contagious diseases. Sure. Yeah, so vaccination is one really important, to, um, important reason to go see a vet. Are there other things people should be considering, you know, even just establishing sure. a good relationship with a vet so that... For sure. So, yeah, so super important. So... One of the most important things is your physical exam, you know, checking your little kitten out by your veterinarian. So just like, you know, if your kids, you know, you want to, you know, you always want to go to your doctor, you know, to have a good evaluation. Um, and so a new kitten, yeah, we want to, we want to check them out. We look at their eyes, their ears, listen to their heart. Um, we're going to check to make sure they're correct sex. Oftentimes people think their cat is a male cat and it's a female cat. I just mm -hmm. had that happen mm -hmm. like last week. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it can be difficult to sex kittens. Um, so we'll get the sex straight for you. Um, other important things are parasites um, mm -hmm. where um, there's a life cycle of some parasites that oftentimes, even if you get a new kitten, they might have been dewormed uh, at least once, but the life cycle of the parasite, sometimes there's, just got exposed to them and it has to get maybe a couple of weeks to the parasite to mature just a little bit so where we can kill those parasites with the dewormer. So usually we're deworming them several times and almost each visit they're coming in with the vet uh, visit. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think something that can be surprising to people is, you know, as organizations, we do as much as we can um, you know, and I always say like a healthy kitten is a healthy kitten today. It doesn't, you know, things can change in kittens' bodies very quickly. And uh, that's absolutely true when it comes to parasites. You know, you deworm a kitten, but it's not like one or even maybe two times is a guarantee that they're not going to have something else um, come up. And then, of course, uh, when people say, you know, oh, this kitten was dewormed, that would not necessarily cover the full spectrum of all the parasites that they exactly, might have. Exactly, exactly. Right? People think they may just have worms, but we have other parasites that are not worms that we're looking for in the stool samples. Um, so there are coccidia and giardia, um, you know, those can cause, you know, vomiting and diarrhea and they're very easily treatable. You know, all of, a lot of these things, these parasites are so easily treatable. And the other issue is uh, people can sometimes pick up some versions of these parasites too. Not so much adults, but children seem to be a little more prone to that. So, and kids, you know, they really want to get the kitten in their face and, you know, and, and so, you know, you don't want to risk people getting those parasites too, especially kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another great reason that, you know, even if you're getting a kitten from a very reputable organization, they've vaccinated them, they've dewormed them, there might still be some responsibility on your part to finish that cycle. Um, can you talk then about, you know, a lot of people adopt a kitten from a shelter or a rescue, but some people adopt a kitten that they've like found in an alley, right? I mean, I think a lot of us have done that. I've certainly done that, found a kitten outside and adopt them. Mm -hmm. um, and these mm -hmm. kittens have no health history, nothing at all. Um, so for people who are taking in a kitten that has never seen a vet, um, what are the types of things you're doing with that kitten? Or, you know, how, how many times should somebody be coming in and seeing a vet for a kitten that they rescued off the street? Sure. So, um, you know, if they're just rescuing, it also depends on the age, you know, of the kitten. So, you know, if they are, you know, tiny little kitten, you know, a few weeks old or so, then they might need like bottle feeding, you know, which mm -hmm. is that can be difficult for a lot of people to do correctly. Um, if they are eating solid food, you know, then then they're a lot easier to take care of. Um, and what we're watching for with these ones that are, you know, just found is, you know, do they come with parasites, you know, which is a common scenario because they've been out and about and, the, and parasites actually get passed through the mother's milk. So that's how they get them often. Um, and they might have other parasites like fleas, ear mites. Um, these are fairly common things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then respiratory 
um, infections are very common in, in kittens. Think of it as a cold, you know, a cat cold. Um, they're typically viruses um, and they can vary in severity from, you know, a mild little sniffle or a little sneeze to pneumonia, you know, and they can get really sick. And we're trying, again, trying to prevent these things with vaccines. Um, another important thing is when you, you're finding a kitten, a lot of times a mother cat might be lurking around, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, try, just, you know, sometimes it takes just a little being patient, you know, and seeing, is this kitten crying? Is it underweight? You know, does it look sickly or does it look healthy and happy? You know, it may have a mother cat somewhere. So sometimes it takes a good, you know, a few hours to a half a day or so to kind of you know, watch and see, is it, you know, is it in a safe place? And does the mother kitten, mother cat come back for the kitten? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even more important, if you have found a kitten outside, um, you know, I, I would say as somebody who takes in kittens directly from the street, it would be a miracle to get a kitten who doesn't have something going on that they, <laughs> that they need veterinary assistance with, whether that's right. Ear yeah. They'll be, they can be underweight parasites yeah. that, you know, the respiratory symptoms and diarrhea, you know, are very common, you know, with little kittens and mm -hmm. getting on a, a good diet too, you know, mm -hmm. is important. Well, let's, let's talk about respiratory issues for a moment because that is so common. And, you know, I think sometimes people think of, you know, themselves and if, oh, if I get a sniffly nose, no big deal. I can still, you know, go about my day. Um, but for kittens, it can be, there can be kind of a cascading uh, effect of, of having like a stuffed up nose or inability mm -hmm. to, you know, breathe very well. Um, why do sure. kittens get respiratory issues so commonly? Like what, what is the reason that you see that more in a kitten than in an adult cat? And what is the risk of letting something like that go untreated? It really is because their immune systems are not mature. You know, they just, you know, again, just like, for example, like kids, you know, think of kids, you know, they're, you know, they're, they pick up all those infections very easily, human children. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, the babies are just, their immune systems are not mature. It's so easy to pick those things up. And it's not just one virus, it's a, a few viruses that all act fairly similar with respiratory symptoms. Mm -hmm. And they, you might see eye discharge, you might see sneezing, you might see coughing, um, and then, you know, severe symptoms could be pneumonia. And um, even if kittens have, you know, they, they really, cats in general and kittens are driven by smell of their food. And so if they get a little stuffed up nose, they don't want to eat and mm -hmm. they can, you know, they can get dehydrated and, you know, and that spirals into a worse, you know, scenario. So just some, just some first aid, you know, basic, you know, treatment of symptoms, like keeping their nose clean and make sure, you know, the food is nice and stinky, you know, warm it up some, you know, make sure they eat it um, mm -hmm. to help keep them happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, I, I hear people say sometimes, well, I just, you know, I'm using a hot steamy shower to help keep their um, mm -hmm. respiratory tract open, which I think is, is definitely one tool. But um, there is a certain point at which veterinary intervention is absolutely necessary, right? So how would you sure. help somebody understand when it's something they can kind of manage at home versus when they really do need to go to a vet for a respiratory issue? So... Oftentimes, you know, people are not sure, and most all veterinarians, we uh, can triage that over the phone. You know, we can ask you some basic questions, you know, hey, is your kitten eating? Okay, if it's not eating, maybe you need to bring it to the vet because they, you know, they don't have a lot of body reserves. They get dehydrated, they, get low, they can get low in their blood sugar, which is another important thing. So if they're not eating, yeah needs to go to the vet. Um, if they are having trouble breathing, you know, if it looks like they're kind of sitting hunched up and breathing kind of heavy, okay, that's another symptom. Hey, you need to bring it to the vet. And then they will also get fevers with these infections sometimes. Uh, and, you, you know, symptoms would, of a fever be basically lethargy. They feel kind of down. They, you know, don't want to play. Kittens, if they're healthy and happy, they should be playful. They should be sleeping a lot. Um, they should be eating multiple times a day, like three to five times a day, depending on the age. Um, and shouldn't be crying. 
you know, if you hear a kitten crying too, something's not right. right. You know, they're too cold. They're hungry. You know, something's bothering them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they will cry occasionally just, you know, for, you know, if they first see you and they, you know, get excited, but you know, if they don't seem like they can calm down. Mm -hmm. You might want to get, get them over to the vet. Sure. And what about eye issues? Like, why do you see, I feel like every kitten gets at some point crusty eyes. How do you help people mm -hmm. understand the difference between like just a little bit of, you know, post sleep crust in their eye versus something that might need like an ophthalmic antibiotic or something like that? Sure. So um, the important things when um, I want to see a cat or a kitten or any animal for their eye issue is if they are wink in the eye, you know, like, ooh, it really hurts. Um, if the eye looks red and the red part would be, you got to pull up the eyelid and look at the white of the eye, you know, yeah. compare it to the other eye. You know, if the white of the eyes, pretty white on both eyes, okay, we're not probably not as a serious an issue. And then any cloudiness or discoloration of the eye. Um, those are really important indicators. Discharge, can be maybe not so serious. So if you get like a little goopy stuff in the eye, you know, as long as those other things aren't happening, winking, the redness of the eye or any cloudiness in the eye might not be as serious. Mm -hmm. But those first three things, yes, bring them into mm -hmm. the vet so we can see that. Mm -hmm. they, those are also um, important because of the viruses that they get. Um, the viruses that affect the respiratory symptom also affect the eyes mm -hmm. and the conjunctive of the lining of the eye. So that's why we okay. see a lot of those things. They're all tied together with the respiratory yeah. stuff. And I love what you said about triaging over the phone. I think that's such a good thing for people to know that like you can just make a call and ask, mm -hmm. do I need to come in or mm -hmm. do I not mm -hmm. need to come in? And I think that's helpful for the adopter, but also for the vet, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, eyes, especially, um, they can get bad really quickly or they can get better really quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, like we've seen with, you know, your some of your little orphan kittens, some of them, you know, you know, you don't get them until, oh, my gosh, that is like maybe not good for future vision. Like maybe mm -hmm. their eyes are not going to function normally. So mm -hmm. you got to be on top of eye issues early to you know make sure they preserve vision and, and he have healthy eyes. Sure, absolutely. And then the other thing you mentioned that you see a lot is GI issues. We did talk about parasites mm -hmm. a bit, um, but there mm -hmm. are other reasons that a kitten might be having a GI issue. I, I am very, very passionate about kitten poop <laughs> um, and uh, making sure that kittens have good poop. And um, I think a lot of people make this assumption that well, a lot of kittens have diarrhea, so like no big deal. They'll probably get over it on their own. Can you kind of um, like talk about that myth a little bit that like it's okay if kittens just have diarrhea? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's one of our important indicators for animal health in general. We mm -hmm. typically ask about vomiting, diarrhea, coughing, sneezing. Those are our basic four. You know, if your animal is doing those things, you know, we need to we need to look into it and get that corrected. Um, and kittens, they don't have again going back to their body reserves. They're super tiny. They don't have very many body reserves. If they're having diarrhea, they can get rapidly dehydrated and low in their blood sugar. Uh, the, you know, and they might have to get hospitalized to correct something like that. So if we can get on top of that early, we can avoid more serious complications, you know, mm -hmm. developing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, little babies, they shouldn't have diarrhea. Um, we need to correct that. And it goes back to checking for parasites, making their on, making sure they're on a correct diet. Um, and, uh, making sure they don't have something wrong with how they were formed. There are some congenital disorders, like something they were born with that's not correct, you know, in their digestive tract. Um, they're at the humane side. We've even had a couple of kittens that didn't have an opening out of their anus, you know, mm -hmm. and um, if that was, that's correctable. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. And people don't realize people that yeah. I've had a couple myself and, I never knew before having one, like that, that was even a possibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there are, like you said, a number of congenital issues that can come up with kittens that, that is a great reason, especially if you're an adopter to go to a veterinarian, because if you're not used to looking at kitten anatomy or 
understanding what is normal for a kitten. You know, a veterinarian can very quickly say, this, something seems wrong, you know, do whatever diagnostics are necessary to determine if there could be something yeah. congenitally. And that, first, and that first visit with that physical exam is so important. You know, we, we're doing a, a nose to tail exam. We're going to be checking over, you know, all the basic systems and make sure they weren't born with something abnormal, make sure we're preventing diseases and making sure they're, you know, protected, you know, from everything in the future and get them on a, a good first start. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, the importance of diet, and I think a lot of people don't realize that there's not just like cat food. There's there's like cat food for all different life stages, including for kittens. Can you talk about mm -hmm. why somebody should consider putting their kitten on a diet that's actually for kittens, and like what what do kittens nutritionally need that is different than a different life stage? Yeah, they are growing so quickly. And so their bones and their muscles, they're just growing so fast and they need extra calories. You know, so the food needs to be more dense so they can grow quickly and they need those extra minerals to kind of help those things to grow. So they need more calcium. Those bones are growing so fast. They need that calcium and that calcium and phosphorus really has to be in the correct balance. Um, it, you know, feeding a kitten, uh, an adult cat food doesn't help as well as a kitten food, which is designed for growth. Mm -hmm. um, and then feeding kitten foods to an adult cat, mm, it's a little too rich, you know, they're gonna have some weight gain and some, you know, yeah, mostly the weight gain is the biggest issue. Um, you know, it's very rich and maybe diarrhea with how rich that food is, mm -hmm. but the kittens, they need it, they need to grow. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like putting fertilizer on your plants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? sure. Well, and I can say, you know, my you can tell that that kitten food is full of good stuff because my cats envy it so much every time they see the kitten food. Yep. They're like, let me have some of that. I'm like, you do not need right. food that is formulated yeah. for a kitten. But kittens really you know, do. And, and, and they're coming. Yeah. And, and they're coming off of nursing, you know, mm -hmm. from their mother, which, you know, the milk is high in calcium and fats and, you know, proteins, you know, so they're transitioning from, you know, all that they need from their mother to, okay, now we need to replace that with solid food in mm -hmm. that similar situation. Mm -hmm. So super important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of, of kitten diets. Um, I want to talk to you about something that this was like the most exciting thing for me to talk to you about because I consider you like an incredible, incredible expert at this, which is spaying and neutering. Um, for anyone watching this, Dr. Camerata does all of our spays and neuters, and I've never seen such beautiful surgeries in my life. Um, we just love the surgeries you do so much. And, um, you know, I, that for the kittens in my rescue, we're, we're doing their surgeries right around two pounds, shortly after two months usually. Uh, and sometimes people are surprised by that, but you do a ton of this for, for us, for other rescues, for the Humane Society. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, kind of these younger spay neuters that you do for rescues. Why is that, you know, why is that done? Um, and what is your experience with that? Like. What, what is the benefit for the animal and for animals generally when we're spaying and neutering um, at that age? At that young age. Yeah, so, um, you know, so I, I, I never used to do those when I was in private practice. We kind of waited until they got through all their vaccines and then we, you know, went and spayed or neutered them. But working at the Humane Society, uh, the goal is to not you know, let those animals that leave the shelter to reproduce. Okay. We don't want to see more animals come back to the shelter. And so spaying and neutering them, you know, when they're ready to just be adopted, um, is the goal. And so we don't adopt them out until they've been spayed and or neutered, which happens at that. They have to be a certain size, um, at six to eight weeks is when we'll do it. Um, but, we have to be much more careful with these little tiny kittens because anesthesia kind of lowers body temperature, affects their blood sugar. So we need to be quick. You know, we need to do these spays super fast and we need to, you know, have the anesthesia last only I'll do a kitten spay in like five or six minutes. Um, okay. you know, and then, 
you know, we recover them, we give a reversal of the anesthesia, and they're up and around, and they're playing in the cage after they've been spayed because mm -hmm. the incision sites are super tiny, like so maybe, small. you know, a, you know, a, a quarter inch or so. Um, and so they don't even hardly recognize, I think, that they had a surgery done because this, there's not a lot of cutting and, and things. And, you know, think of it like laparoscopic, you know, mm -hmm. where we can do laparoscopic surgeries on people. Um, this is the laparoscopic size spay and neuters. Mm -hmm. And so the kittens, they just, they bounce back so quick. When we're doing more older kitten spays and neuters, the surgery takes a little longer um, and there's a little more body fat. It takes, you know, it's a little harder surgery. Mm -hmm. In these tiny little guys, as long as you have someone who is is good at doing them, it, it is like, I, I actually prefer them because they're bouncing back, you know, super fast. They're playing in their cage like an hour later. Sure. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you was about recovery times and also like complications. Like if you see, because I would guess based on my personal experience, which of course is limited to young kittens, I would guess that you would see fewer complications and faster recovery because the kittens that yes. we get, I mean, they come home and they're like, oh, did something happen? <laughs> you know, and it's right. like, you're supposed to be resting. And they're like, no, no, I'm climbing the cat tree. Like I'm fine. And, yeah. and, uh, we have sure. so few issues after spay or neuter. Sure. So the, um, the older cats are one of the complications is pestering the surgery site, you know, cause little tiny kittens, they're not so coordinated. They, they're not, they're just learning how to groom. So they're a little goofy about it. It's hard for them to pester a surgery site. Um, and then, they're sleeping a lot, you know, their kittens, their babies are sleeping a lot. Whereas you have like a young adult, you know, they're running around, they're jumping off the furniture, you know, these little babies, they barely can get up on the couch, let alone on the top of the dresser, you know, mm -hmm. jumping down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the bigger guys are just, you know, they're very active and, you know, they're going to pester that site and the mm -hmm. little babies, they heal up just so quick, you know? Yeah. yeah. They're so easy. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about like post-surgical recommendations because um, oftentimes I'll post a photo of a kitten and say, you know, oh, she just got her spay, she's doing great, and I'll get a thousand comments, where's her cone? Why isn't she wearing a cone? And mm -hmm. we, we almost never need cones for ours, but I wonder if it is because of their age and because of the incision size and, you know. The right, because the... Yeah, the surgery site, um, there's no external stitches, okay? There's nothing for them to really pester at either. So even my adult spays, um, I don't, I, I, I'll send home a collar, but it's hard for them to do much to that site. The whole reason for the e-collar is so they don't pester it. But when you have an incision site that's super tiny and no stitches on the outside, they don't even know where to bother themselves because it's, they don't even know it's there. Hmm. So yeah. So yeah, we don't, I don't usually, and in male cats, even there's even, it's not an abdominal incision, so they don't really have anything to pester either. Um, so the incision site's so tiny. Why animals will pester surgery sites is because of pain or irritation and, hmm. or they feel something that shouldn't be there. So that would be the external stitches or a larger surgery site might be uncomfortable. So they're mm -hmm. going to pester when you get down to these micro surgeries. Um, they don't even recognize something happened. So you don't really need a lot of protection from that. And there's not much they can damage. There's no stitches on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it should be said that every, every practice is going to do spays and neuters a little bit differently. So, um, For sure. the yeah. post surgical recommendations that you give might be different than another clinic because another clinic is doing exactly. surgery in a different way. Um, but I certainly right. feel very, most very clinics fortunate aren't. that ours are yeah. so simple. Right. And most clinics aren't doing these little tiny babies. You know, they just don't have vets who have that, um, experience where I've done literally thousands, you know, of little or little tiny babies, you know, kittens, uh, less than two pounds. Sure. Um, it shows. It's amazing. Yeah, we're we're yeah, so lucky to yeah, have you. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, I want to ask you one more question about, you know, you work with cats of all ages, um, and you know, probably better than anyone that cats sometimes don't love going to the vet. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, they can have 
a difficult time on the car ride or in the carrier or with some I of I think of it kind of like an alien abduction, you know? Sure, yeah. <laughs> you, know, so, they, you know, they're like, wow, what, what is going on, you know? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but with a kitten, kittens are kind of a blank canvas. Like, you know, they don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. You take them somewhere new and they're like, oh, wow, what's this? Okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. what, what recommendations do you have for new adapters who want to – do things that are going to make vet care easier later on. Mm -hmm. So there's a, yeah, quite a few things that can be done. So one is kind of doing some of the things that the vet might do in the office with touching. Okay. So like looking in the ears, looking in mm -hmm. the mouth, looking at the teeth, um, feeling them and, you know, looking under their tail, checking, checking their toes, you know, all that handling that it's not a shocker that, oh my gosh, the vet's touching me places where, you know, my people don't touch me. Um, so the touch and then the, um, the container or the crate or however they're going to be bringing the cat into the vet office, it should be a familiar something. So a lot of times, you know, if, if someone is adopting a pet, they get a crate or something along that time. But also if not, get the crate, get a crate. Um, and you can leave it out um, and you can put treats or you can put toys and they'll go in there and sometimes they'll like to kind of just even sit in it. Cats love boxes, you know, they just love it. Um, so getting them used to being carried in something to the vet. And then, um, you know, we have them coming in frequently as kittens. So hopefully we're establishing that, you know, it's not too scary of a thing, but you know, if they're a little hesitant, you know, a lot of veterinarians and veterinary offices will, you know, offer to just have like a social visit, you know, oh. if you just want to come in, you know, to help that out. So you just come in and you just have, you know, have us give some treats, you know, and then, okay, that's it. It wasn't a scary visit, you know, and yeah. then they got the whole bar ride, the whole crate, you know, and that experience and, you know, realize, hey, it's not so bad. Um, but, you know, we, the goal is not to make a fearful experience at the vet as best we can. We're trying to avoid as best we can stressful events at the vet, because then that's what they'll remember the most is, you know, mm -hmm. the stressful event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are things that will be beneficial to their health later on that you can start doing as a kitten, you know, things like trimming their nails regularly. Um, what about toothbrushing? Is that something you recommend for kittens? Yeah, that's if if you can get in the habit, it is so beneficial. OK, you know, to tell you the truth, you know, most people, you know, are, you know, don't get into the habit. It's hard. Everybody's busy, you know, um, but, you know, if you can start them young, OK, nail trimming, brushing the teeth, brushing their hair and experiencing a bath or two while they're a kitten, because these can be quite difficult in a more adult animal when they've never had it happen before. Um, there's a window of up to about maybe three or four months where if they experience a lot of these things, um, it's not scary later on in life. But uh, what happens is sometimes things that don't get thought of until they're more of an adult and then it's more traumatic for them. They just get hardwired at a certain point, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of soft wired early on and you can train them sure. a lot easier. So practice that nail trimming, even if it doesn't need to be done, practice that teeth brushing, even though it's not needing to be done at that young age, because all they have, all their baby teeth are going to fall out, you know, but it's more, you know, maybe a couple once or twice a week, even just to kind of practice it, to get them, mm -hmm. you know, used to it. And, mm -hmm. You know, if you got in the habit with your older cat, it only takes a few minutes to do the brushing, you know, mm -hmm. of the teeth. Mm -hmm. So it really helps to slow that tartar buildup. Yeah. Well, kittens definitely are malleable. You know, my little kitten Ferguson, who you know, uh, mm -hmm. he has been poked and prodded and given medication for his entire life. And now he actually thinks it's like a treat and he, <laughs> he like gets excited for medication and yeah. Um, he's doing so well now that like we're, a lot of his medication has decreased, but he's like looking at me like, come on, aren't we going to do medicine? <laughs> sure. And you can always, and you can always tell these like, uh, kittens that were like bottle fed orphans that were kept in little groups, you know, for good socialization, you know, especially at like the humane society where they have a whole kitten nursery, you know, of hundreds mm -hmm. of kittens that they've had all of these things done already. And mm -hmm. if you can ever get you know, one of these kittens from like a rescue like that, like your rescue, you know, or Humane Society's nursery, these kittens are the most docile 
and, you know, mm. pets they really make great pets for kids because they've been handled so much being the bottle fed, having their little bottoms wiped, you know, and, you know, medicating, you know, they've had it all done already. So mm. such great pets. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. And, you know, I think that rescues and vets working together is a magical thing. And um, I'm so grateful for the work that you do with our kittens and um, the wonderful uh, services that you provide to them. And I'm really grateful you can well, share like with too. me it's today. Fun. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, bringing kittens to you is probably fun and cute too, but <laughs> not that you don't see uh, uh, yeah. all the staff, because we don't get to see that many babies like that. And all our staff just kind of ooze and ahs and like has to snuggle <laughs> with all your little babies. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I'm sure the kittens yeah. like it too. Well, thank you so yeah. very much. It's been wonderful talking with you. I really appreciate sure. you and um, we'll see you next time at the clinic. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thank have a good morning. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you everybody for watching. I want to again, thank Royal Canin for partnering with me on the Cat to Vet series, as well as the Take Your Cat to the Vet initiative. Um, please check out their website. You can learn so much more. It's royalcanin.com slash cat health. You guys, I've had so much fun doing all of this. Um, please stay curious about your cats, stay compassionate, and don't forget, you can find this entire series at kittenlady.org slash catology. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye-bye.